All right, we're talking about uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and uh, jobs guarantees and teachers unions on... That's me trying to talk through my stupid mask because apparently we're never going to not be wearing them. On episode 254 of the In the Tank podcast, as always, I'm your host, Donald Kendall. Joining me today, I have got Justin Haskins, editorial director at the Heartland Institute, wearing his non-politically correct whaler's hat. That's right, Donald. I well, hate whales, and I'm not afraid to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, you guys didn't see that one coming, did you? Do you hate the most? I didn't see it coming. That's, I love that's, it. No, that's obvious. The kind of whale that I hate the most? Killer whales. They yeah. kill people. Free Willy. He's the worst. They're kill yeah, he was the worst. That movie that movie was I saw him but a hit life. job on, on <laughs> that was nothing but a hit job on the aquarium industry. That's all that was. Uh I think you're mixing up uh some, movies some there. Isaac Gore a financed BS. Policy fellow at the center of the American experiment. How are you, good sir? Great. Awesome. And we got Jim Lakely, VP of the Heartland Institute. What's going on, sir? How's everybody uh, doing? Uh, rest in peace, Herman Cain, who passed away today. Herman Cain, famous for... 999. Pizza joint, right? What was Godfather's that? Pizza, yeah. Godfather's Pizza. He ran for president a couple of times. We had a colleague that worked for his campaign at one point. Really? Uh, yeah, you don't remember? Constitutional reform guy? <laughs> anyway okay that makes so. sense um <laughs> so let's go oh. <laughs> another glorious beginning yeah. <laughs> um so there is an oh. article that justin and i were talking on the way home or well i was on my way home from work the other day um and he says oh there was an article from the blaze that just popped up say uh, titled politico publishes piece claiming camilla harris kamala harris is Biden's VP pick quickly scrubs it. So before reading this article, I thought, uh, and I said this to you when we were talking about it, I said, I bet it was just like a joke. Like somebody put it in there because they speculate that this is the case, but it's not. And it just, somebody hit publish when they shouldn't have, you know, because I've always kind of ruled out her as being the VP. Um, and then I thought, like, maybe we should, you know, open up the show kind of speculating on who the, we think the VP is actually going to be. But then I read the article in preparation for the podcast, and it starts off saying political made waves on social media Tuesday when they published and promptly corrected a biography of Senator Camilla Harris claiming Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden has chosen her as his running mate days from now on August uh, 1st. Says the bio, uh, the bio reads, Joe Biden chose Kamala Harris to become his running mate for the 2020 election on August 1st, two weeks before the Democratic National Convention, after keeping his choice close to the chest for months. In his announcement, Biden called Harris a worthy opponent and a worthy running mate, alluding to the pair's rivalry during the early stages of the Democratic primary. She will bring her experience as a prosecutor household name recognition and skill as a debater to the ticket. So after reading this, I was like, Hmm, I think that she might actually be the, I think that she might actually be the nominee. And mm -hmm. they got like this, this like embargoed information that they were supposed to kind of like keep under wraps until the announcement was made official and they blew it. So I'm changing, I'm changing what I had to say uh, over the phone with you, Justin. And I think that this was actually the case. What do you think? Am I right? Yes. And the reason why you're right, not only because you're copying what I had already told you and I'm always right, is because uh, the... Please clap. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good timing, Andy. Well done. Um, the, 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 the thing is, if you're going to choose an African-American woman, liberal, to be your vice presidential candidate, which is the box that Joe Biden has built around himself... Uh, then you really don't have a whole lot of choices. I mean, there just aren't a lot of options out there. And because of that, I think Kamala Harris is the one who has the most name recognition. She's in the Senate. Um, and I think really that's all that matters at this point. However, uh, and we'll, I guess we can get into this, you know, 
we don't have to get into it right now, but I think she's an absolutely horrible, horrible, horrible pick. Terrible. Absolutely terrible. So I do think she's going to be the pick. And I do think it's going to be a disaster. And I would even venture to say that it's possible this could cost Joe Biden the election. It's that bad. Of a well, I, I want to ask Jim on this because I was going back. I was actually trying to find the uh, who's your your girlfriend, Tulsi Andy Gabbard. Tulsi Gabbard. I was trying to find the Tulsi <laughs> Gabbard clip where she's like going at Camilla Harris. And uh, the, I found a clip, but it started off with Camilla Harris going after Joe Biden. And she accused him of working with the segregationists to oppose busing programs. And she said that if Joe Biden got his way, I wouldn't be a senator. Cory Booker wouldn't be a senator. And Barack Obama wouldn't be in the position to appoint Biden to the position of the title, which now he which he now holds. So it was pretty vicious. This clip I was watching. So, Jim, I mean, is that pretty standard practice in politics where you're at each other's throats one day and then you're picking them to be your running mate the next? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I love the idea of imagining a world in which uh, Kamala Harris and Cory Booker are not in the United States Senate. So uh, I'm glad that that thought has been planted in my head. Also, Don, Donna, you call her Camilla. Uh, uh, Justin, I think you said. I say Kamala. Kamala. I mean, I, or uh, Kamala or whatever. I don't know. I, I think it's Kamala as in Pamela. But uh, I guess we're all going to find out because I think it's much more likely than not that she is the pick. I think uh, Politico accidentally posting that on their website. Uh, they did not do that for every single person on his supposed short list. And then it just accidentally got uh, put there. This is actually a lot of proof. There's lots of proof out there, but this is why and how the Democratic Party and their and their media, the mainstream media, work together. Um, they they leaked this. They already know it's going to happen, and so that's going to be the appointment. Of course, um, on Saturday, August first, uh, when some people will be listening to this podcast, I may be proven wrong, and then we'll just delete it from the internet, just like Google del deletes everything conservatives do from the internet. Yeah, well, but, I but 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 no, just to to finally get to your question, um, yeah. in 1988. Um, uh, when I'm sorry, yes, 19, um, I'm sorry, 1980, when, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan was running for, for president, he had a pretty tough, um, primary fight with one George H W Bush who described supply side economics as uh, promoted by Ronald Reagan as voodoo economics. And they actually were at each other's throats. And I don't think either of them, uh, accused the other of being a segregationist or liking segregation, but they went at each other pretty hard. And then Reagan picked Bush as his vice presidential nomination and went on to sweeping victory. So this is not all that unusual. Um, the thing about um, Kamala Harris is that she is, I don't think anybody is as unlikable as Hillary Clinton, but she is extremely unlikable. She is so phony. Uh, I was watching some interviews of her you know, to prepare for this and remembering some of the debates. She is so unlikable. I mean, the one thing about Joe Biden, even though he seems to be in cognitive decline, is that he at least can fake authenticity and being a nice guy, he can fake it pretty well. Kamala Harris has a really, really hard time doing that. And I think that's going to turn a lot of voters off. Yeah. You know, one of the reasons why I thought this might not be the case is because like in writing and journalism, there is like a practice where you could uh, pre-write something. A lot of the times it happens with um, you know, um, obituaries, they do obituaries. that. Probably. Right. You know, somebody is kind of towards the tail end of their life. They'll have it so that they could just like hit post, basically type in a couple of the details and hit post and just get going. So I was thinking that that could be in the case with this, but, um, I don't know. It's really seemed, and I guess we'll find out August 1st. And then I was wondering if there's a precedent for that August 1st thing. Cause that's a Saturday. Does, does news like this get dropped on a Saturday? I wasn't sure. So I went back and Googled some of this because sometimes if you want to get like a lot of press coverage, you know, you put it at the beginning of the week so that you could talk about it all week long uh, versus doing it over the weekend. A lot of times that's like to hide news. That's how I've always thought about it. So I looked back. <clears throat> Hillary Clinton picked her, uh, announced her VP, which was uh, what's that guy's name? Kane? Tim, Tim Kane, Senator Tim from Virginia. Nobody remembers. Herman Kane. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that was announced on Friday evening. So that puts it pretty close in line with this uh, Saturday thing. Uh, Trump announced Pence on a Friday morning. And Romney announced, does anyone know who Romney's running mate was? Uh, Paul Ryan. Really? 
Okay. Uh, he announced that on Saturday. So there is a lot of precedent for this news being dropped on oh Saturday. Oh, my God. And, I, and I'll tell you why they do it, actually, so that they can dominate the Sunday talk shows the ne- that weekend. Oh, um, that's, that's some inside about. baseball stuff yeah. right there. That's true. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, that's you smart. want them on the Sunday shows. Because it's uh, an entirely political story, and so they would dominate the yep. Sunday the Sunday shows and then talk about it all the following week. It's if Kamala. Really on Monday, you would lose all that momentum. And there would be all these problems with with Kamala Harris being picked that would be pointed out and picked on on the Sunday show. Now you just talk about the announcement. Yep. Smart. Uh, Isaac, you didn't want to talk about this topic. Is there anything you want to ch- <laughs> chime in on with this? Or uh, I want to be able to include you. I don't want to. Ignore He's still you. bitter that Amy Klobuchar isn't the candidate. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that she pulled herself out because she's not black. Yeah. And I'd like to see how your hair would fare in a blizzard. Isaac, your impression is still on point there. Oh, man. Thank you. I've been working on it still, even though it's not going to be as useful as I was hoping it would be. <laughs> You're going to have to uh, come up with some Kamala Harris uh, impression soon. I'll have to like study her then. That's like mm-hmm. the sad thing. Uh, yeah. One thing I will add is... Do you guys remember the SNL skit with Dana Carvey where he was Tom Brokaw and he was doing like Gerald Ford dead today after being ripped apart by a pack of wolves? <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that. That One came to mind like, as Donnie was mentioning that about the yeah. Gerald Ford dead today and I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> that was just like the, the bit. It was pretty funny. Great bit. <laughs> Thanks, Dana Great Carvey. The conversation there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, Justin, I think you kind of tease that you think that this is an absolutely horrible pick. Um, care to yeah. explain? Yeah, this makes nobody happy. Nobody's happy with this pick. I mean, if you think about it, what does she bring to the table? Okay, well, she's I a mean, cop. Well, she, what do you mean she's a cop? Kamala's yeah, she's a cop. A cop prosecutor in California. Right, right. A cop. right. It. Yeah, right. But that's a downside. That's not a plus. <laughs> Yeah. That, this is the, the Democratic. <laughs> the last thing you want to do if you're the Democratic Party right now is alienate the base. And the, the best way to alienate the base is to pick somebody who <laughs> was seen as being heavily on the side of prosecutors. These are people who are literally burning down cities right now because they don't like cops. And you're going to pick somebody who's like got a track record of being pro police, pro prosecutor. Like that doesn't make any sense at all. Like none. And then on top of it, as Jim pointed out, horrible personality. So there's, there you go. The other thing is this, she comes from California, a a state that Biden's going to win no matter what. Okay. We, it could be weekend at Bernie's with, with uh, Joe Biden and he would still win California. Like there, there's nothing that could happen that would allow the Republican to win California. So why would you choose someone from California? Not only that, but she doesn't help you on any of the West coast States. You're going to win all of them anyway. So what does she provide you? Look, the Democrats have still not figured this out and I don't know why, but to win the election, you have to win the Midwest. That's how you win. That's the only way to win. You cannot win unless you win back states that Trump won in 2016 in the Midwest. So that's your Wisconsin's, Michigan's. Uh, I consider Pennsylvania sort of part of the Midwest. That's that's Wrong. what you have to. It's in the well, Eastern Time Zone. If it's that, in the that, Eastern Time irrelevant. Zone, it can't be the Midwest. That's not true. That's yes, not true. It's very that's, true. That's ridiculous. But besides, that's besides the point. The the point is you have to win these states that Kamala Harris if anything hurts you in these states, do you really think people in Wisconsin are looking at Kamala Harris and saying, Oh wow, Kamala Harris, like I'm voting for Biden now, you know, screw Trump. Like, no, there isn't a single person in Wisconsin, not a single person who is choosing to vote for Joe Biden because he picked Kamala Harris, but there probably are some people who will be like Kamala Harris. I'm not voting for that guy. So (laughs) what, why, why the heck? Why the heck would you choose someone who is not going to help you in the states that you need to win in, you know? And, and so normally you would look at this and say, well, this is totally illogical, but if you start with the premise of, I have to choose an African American woman, which is the social justice, you know, warrior mentality that they went into this whole thing with, which I just don't understand at all then I guess you don't really have that many options. And Kamala Harris seems like the most qualified person. And one last point um, on, on that particular point. argument, because I do, yeah, because I do think that that is really key here. I think one of the biggest challenges that they have 
is that if you look at the list of people who qualify, African-American women, what you'll realize very quickly is that most of them are like mayors or state reps or people like that, right? So none of them are obviously qualified to, I don't know, be the leader of the most powerful military in the world or have foreign policy experience or any of these things that normally you would think of as being for, for a president. And with Joe Biden, it matters more than ever before because Joe Biden looks like he might be, you know, admitted to a, to a, <laughs> to like, to like a retirement facility or something tomorrow. How dare you? Uh, I was going to say COVID death factory, but, uh, well, you know, are, those tomato, are tomato, <laughs> whatever. I mean, I, but that's the, but that's, I mean, that's a real thing. Even people who like Joe Biden have to admit that the odds of this guy lasting eight years in this position are pretty much zero. Like there's a 0% chance that Joe Biden is president eight years from now. So, I mean, come on, it, it's just not possible. So well, they're going to be extra critical of whoever this person is on those particular points. And at least Kamala Harris can say, well, I've got all this experience in the Senate and you know, whatever. And maybe that's good enough to help drive that home. But I mean, but, but don't you think that maybe this is an okay pick in the turn in the, in the thought process of, Joe Biden's been running to the left since he won the primary, and this helps center him a little bit more in like scared suburbs. No, no way. I don't think this centers him at all. Ka Kamala Harris was pro Green New Deal, pro Green New Deal, pro single payer health care, pro all these things that Joe Biden was not. Okay. And so I actually think it's the opposite. I mean, I actually think he's moved, this is helping him move further to the left which again, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense if you're trying to win Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania, which are not far left-wing states. So what is the logic here? It, it, it's just, other than pandering to your base that already hates Trump and is already voting for you, I don't know why else you would do But that. the base hates her too. So I guess Certain that's why you're the saying base hate her too. Yeah. And so that's why I said it's a horrible candidate. Like, I don't know who, who is looking at this and saying, Oh yeah, Kamala Harris. Like who, who they, she, she was hated even amongst Democrats. When she ran, she got like what? 3% of the vote, you know, at, at most support, like in polling. I mean, she was never a serious candidate. I think at the most, it was like five, six, seven points or something at her height. And it plummeted even after that. I mean, she, she was nowhere near the choice, you know, so I can't understand this at all. Well, as the one person in our uh, draft that picked her in the first round, I take offense to those statements. Right. Uh, Justin, but so That's in that, all clip, you really need to know, frankly, <laughs> well, I mean, look, look I, I think it is a weird pick. I'll agree with that. And it, it just seems like it's, it's flailing. I mean, this entire campaign is flailing. You don't have a, a man in Joe Biden who can really lead his campaign and take control of it and tell people what the direction I want to go in. He is, he is a ship um, that has, <laughs> that has stalled and the left is raising the sails and sailing it where they want to go. Uh, and that's quite clear. I mean, maybe the logic, if it is Kamala Harris, maybe the logic is this is going to be a law and order election. And this is really the only uh, Democrat out there in prominence who we could pick that has some kind of quote unquote law and order record because Kamala is a cop. That's what, <laughs> that's what she was. But look, we, what's interesting here is that we all admit and all know that first of all, Joe Biden promised if elected president, he will only serve one term. Um, you know, that's just a promise. There's nothing legally binding on it, but that's what he said. And obviously that's what should happen if he is elected. But I see this as, and the left sees this as a great opportunity. So, um, and I think Kamala Harris is so unprincipled and so and it's such a cynical candidate that the left can make her do whatever they want her to do. The left is what's controlling the Democratic Party right now. The left is controlling this candidacy and the left will control um, all of government. If you can imagine, Joe Biden is president. The House is run by the, by the Democrats and they also take the Senate. Uh, which has actually happened for the first term of each of the last two presidents that have been elected, Barack Obama and Donald Trump. They had they had their party's control of both chambers of Congress for at least two years or for both of them, just for two years. The the hard left, if, if this election goes like that, where Democrats have complete control of the country, the Green New Deal is going to be shoved down our throats. Every leftist um, socialist dreamscape is going to be it's a hellscape for us. But every dream piece of legislation they've ever had is going to be shoved down our throats. We're talking Green New Deal, um, reparations, uh, enormous tax cuts. Um, you know, 
uh, I'm sorry, tax increases, you know, wealth taxes, all of this stuff. It's all going to be shoved down our throats. And if Donald Trump uh, doesn't, obviously he realizes that, but that's what's at stake in this election. The hard left has an opportunity that they've never had before. And that is to actually take the, the levers of power in the United States of America. Isn't that kind of inevitable though? Maybe it is, but I don't want it to happen now. Okay. Yeah, I'm alive. Alive. I'm 30, 40 years when I'm gone. Yes, yeah, exactly. Now. Not while I'm alive. Uh, no, you no. know, I, I, uh, to go back to something that Isaac had said before though, like the, why would the far left even want her? You know, like the far left doesn't even well, really yeah. want her. Well, I want to bring up that point because so you, it's like, you, who wants her? Nobody wants her. I mean, she's far left, but she's pro police. And that's, Col that's Colty, no good. Tulsi Gabbard during like the second, the second debate, uh, Andy's over here fist pumping, dragged her and basically ruined her chances. She was at like 10% at one point. After that debate, she dropped down to like three. And during that debate, she again, she like dragged her over her record as being like the top prosecutor in California, saying that she uh, put like 1500 people in jail over marijuana violations. And then uh, laughed about using marijuana in, a, in an interview later on during the election. She blocked evidence to exonerate a man that was on death row, at least one, and that she kept people in prison past their sentences uh, to use them as cheap labor in the state. So it's like this is this is all, you know, I'll be clear about this. This is all what Tulsi Gabbard said during that. I haven't really confirmed any of this. Uh, but yeah, it was like those things just kind of dropped her from like a realistic pick. So I, yeah, I don't see how like the base quote unquote is going to be like, Oh yeah, yeah. We're cool with all that. Yeah, we'll They're burning that. down police stations. <laughs> They're burning down police stations and vandalizing courthouses. And you're choosing a, a law and order, you know, vice president. They like that, that on the ticket though. They do. That, well, they there's look, there's there's a difference between needing something and knowing that you need something and and needing it with whom. I mean, the thing is, Joe Biden has this big problem. He's had this big problem since he won. And that big problem is that the socialist wing of the party, which is growing bigger and bigger, and bigger, doesn't want him. They don't want him. They don't think he's a real progressive. They think he's a phony and whatever and, and too moderate. And that that's what they think. So that's why they wanted Bernie Sanders because they want a hardcore socialist. Like that's what they want. And uh, I, I don't see how, I don't see how this wins those people over, even though she is farther to the left in terms of policy, she's not in terms of the law and order stuff. And I don't see how it helps you with moderates because they don't like her either. And she's not moderate. She's further to the left than Joe Biden. And so it's like, this just it just makes no sense other well, maybe than she's not the pick and we just spent 24 yeah. minutes it's very possible you know it was all but, but then but then you got to pick another african-american woman who is the pick and keisha lance bottoms yeah mayor no of one. atlanta there's no uh, one so so, keisha, so you're telling me that the mayor of atlanta yes. is gonna be one you know joe biden uh aneurysm away <laughs> from being the the leader of the free world the woman has never done anything beyond you know be mayor of atlanta and now well, she's gonna, gonna tell me the most powerful the guy who ran the tv show the apprentice is going to be sitting in the oval office even though he has no government experience get him that's 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 fair but the difference I, is no no there's a difference the Isaac's difference is right. nobody no he's not and here's it's 2020 why. anything can happen Here, Justin. here's the difference the rock nobody, is running next time here's mark the difference. cuban should run he would win <laughs> mark cuban would have a chance of winning here's the here's the point though the difference is if if keisha lance bottoms is that her name yeah. if keisha lance bottoms was running for president president no one would pick her. No one wants her. It's not like people want her to be president. See, they actually voted for Donald Trump. They knew Donald Trump didn't have that experience and whatever, but they voted for him. Okay. So we, we know there was other things they liked about him that that's why they chose him. In this case, they don't want her. They're not choosing her. Biden's choosing her in this scenario. So now Biden is choosing someone who's one step away from being president of the United States who has no experience or capability or th there's not a single logical reason why she should be president 
and yet she would be the one step away from that happening. I, 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 I don't see how it's not the same thing. I think for that reason, it's not like they're all clamoring for Keisha, whatever Lance bottoms to be you president. No, I don't. No, I don't. I think I've her seen name, her Justin. like maybe twice in my whole life. <laughs> That's right. very disrespectful. What if she just said like that stupid ball guy on the in the tank podcast? Yeah, Justin I would be flattered. Him. I'd be I'd be flattered that All the future uh, president right. of the United States and leader of the free world knows who I am All and right. can I describe my appearance. Right. That's great. I was forgetting right. about Stacey Abrams, the fake governor of fake Georgia. She's still out there as well. That's right. Wearing a cape. Isaac was right in the in the thing that this could be all mislead. And we spent the first half of this podcast talking about something that won't even be the case in two days. So let's move on. Uh, this was brought to my attention. This next topic was brought to my attention by Justin Trashbins. And that has to do with teacher strikes over COVID stuff. So I started with the, the podcast wearing my mask so you couldn't hear a word that I was saying. Uh, but this article that Jim sent me, this is from the Wall Street Journal. It's an opinion piece, but it just kind of starts off saying that the American Federation of Teachers, the second largest edu- education union, threatened safety strikes if reopening plans aren't to its liking. So then I was kind of curious about what these safety strikes could be and, and what their demands are. And it's a pretty wide range of stuff, depending on what state you're looking at. But I found one of the more ridiculous ones. This is from an article in the Washington Examiner, and it's uh, it starts off saying the Los Angeles Teachers Union issued a research paper arguing schools in the district can't reopen without certain policy provisions in place, ranging from mandatory face masks to a moratorium on charter schools and the defunding of police. So <laughs> are we going to be able to meet these people's demands to, so that we can get these kids back into the schools? Uh, Justin, why do you think it was important to talk about this topic? So what I think is so awesome about this story is it so obviously shows that the teachers unions literally don't care about kids at all. <laughs> oh, yeah. They just don't. It, it's it's all about them and like their far left goals. And, and that's pretty much it. Like th- I saw another thing that the one of the other big teachers unions nationally was saying that they wanted they will only agree to restart going uh sending teachers back into schools and uh not having these strikes if that the community uh infection rate is less than 10%. Okay? Mm. And so I looked up community infection rates and it's like the community infection rate is is higher than that in in many places, and so it's it's like what what why are you even putting that in there? You know that it's not going to be met. You know, then they had a transmission rate that it couldn't be higher than one percent. It's like where are you coming up with this stuff? They just there's no they want additional funding. They want to defund the police. They want to do all these other things. No one's actually going to go along with any of this. They know that. So then so why do it? The, the only reason you would do it is as a negotiating tactic in the hopes of getting something out of it uh, in terms of money or whatever at the expense of, you know, kids. And 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 they have a great opportunity to strike now because, you know, COVID, who's going to blame them? A lot of the country won't 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 care. They'll say, oh, yeah, COVID. We don't want to send teachers back to, uh, to to work when they could get infected from all those, you know, kids. Um, so. <laughs> There's so there's like there's a very real I, I, teachers union strike whenever they get an opportunity to. OK, if, if Chicago teachers unions have taught us anything and they haven't taught us much, it's that it's that oh, if dang. they can strike, they Sick will day. strike. Hey, thank you. They will strike always. And so this is a perfect opportunity for them to strike to get some more money out of it. But what does this have to do with kids? How does this help keep, keep kids safe? How does this educate kids? How does this have anything to do with children? The teachers union do not care about kids. They care about their own their their own constituencies. They care and they care about their own bottom line, and that's it. And maybe yeah. that's fine because they're a teachers union, right? But we should stop caring what they think. That's the point because they don't really care about kids, and that's how they've been using that leverage for decades and decades and decades to get the things that they want. And this is just more proof of the fact that they don't really care about kids. They don't really care about education. They care about their own bottom line. And it will always be like that forever. 
Yeah, there was a there was like a pretty famous quote. I was trying to find it while you were talking there, but it completely underscores your sentiment. And it was a uh, Andy, maybe you could try to look this up. I'll try to look it up. But it was like a quote from like a head of a teacher's union. I don't know if it was Chicago or like more of a national thing. And they said like how like they'll start caring about kids when those kids can vote. And like it was how it was it was you know when they start about? paying dues. When they start paying dues, then they'll start yeah. caring about kids. Right, yeah. right, because that's the point. That's the point. Kids your kids lunch money. Yeah, <laughs> kids don't pay teachers' union dues, so who yeah. cares what they have to say? And that's fine, except we all, the, the rest of society, has for some bizarre reason cares what teachers unions think because they think teachers unions are out there protecting kids and that they're taking, you know, educating people. It's not what they're there for. They're, they are there to make as much money as they possibly can for their constituencies and for the leadership. And that's it. See, uh, there it when is. School children start paying union do dues. That's when I'll uh, start representing the interests of school children. Albert Schenker. President right. of the United Federation of Teachers. Yeah, so great. There. If you need any further proof. Yeah, and but and note and notice he was president of two of the largest teachers unions in the country for like 50 years. It wasn't like he was there for like a day. He was like in charge of this for 50 years. And he all the way to the 90s and he was saying this kind of stuff. I am the teachers union. Uh Jim, when you hear these uh it's it almost seems like some type of ransom we won't open the schools until you defund public uh, charter schools. Like that's insane. That is an insane amount of power. Like are these, are these States going to bow down to this or are we just never going to see kids back in the schools? Look, why I do we care? Like, why are we complaining about it? Hey, you know what? Like that, that I don't get it. Everyone's like, Oh, doggone schools are teaching my kids I, you know socialism. What? And now I'm that they're mad you. that the schools aren't open. I'm no, with I'm you. Totally I with just you. am pointing out the hypocrisy. I'm I'm with you, Isaac. Keep them closed forever. I don't care. We'll figure out ways to teach our kids. The, the, the problem here is the uncertainty. If you gave, you know, I guess there's a little bit more time now for parents to figure out how to educate their kids outside of the public school system that they didn't yeah. have. They just pulled it away from, you know, pulled it out from under the rugs from them before. And let's also acknowledge that there are a lot of teachers, I think, that want to get back into the classroom that are not afraid. I mean, we live in a society now where nobody cares about the poor uh, checkout lady at the grocery store or the guy who, you know, runs 7 Eleven or any of these other, you know, so, so called essential businesses. Yet our schools, our public schools that we we pay through the teeth in property taxes to support are just going to hold hostage, um, you know, parents hostage in order to get what they want. I understand this is 100 percent a negotiating tactic. And it's frankly evil. This the economy contracted by 32 percent in the second quarter of this year, 32 percent that blows past anything in the in the worst parts of the great depression crushes it this is the that is the worst economic contraction ever those are the wages of lockdown and if you don't let if parents have to go back to work parents can't afford you know if, if their kids aren't going back to public school how are they supposed to go to work how are they supposed to support their families they are holding the entire nation hostage by not opening up these schools and the idea that it's more dangerous for a public school teacher uh, to be teaching her classes with masks on and distancing um, but it's not dangerous for her to go to the grocery store. It's not dangerous to ha ha fill her gas tank. It's not dangerous for her to go to 7-Eleven or do any of these other things. Um, th this is frankly a very evil tactic and it should, it should be discouraged. It should be condemned everywhere. And these teachers need to get back uh, into the classroom, especially because, um, look, they didn't close down the schools in, in, uh, in many countries in Europe and there is not a problem. With um, with kids transferring uh, cor uh, coronavirus to the teachers, it just hasn't. Been, they've been studying it. They've been watching it. It's not happening. So this idea that it is not safe to send the, the teachers back to school with protective measures is complete garbage. And the unions are exploiting this. And frankly, the politicians on the left who support the teachers' unions are going along with it. Uh, but this is this is outrageous. The, the teachers need to get back to school. There are kids that have special needs that are in special education classes that frankly need the school lunch program in order to keep their nutritions up. Um, they can't do this in um, uh, remote learning. You can't do that stuff in Zoom. There are kids with ADD. They need to, they need hands on instruction. And the younger you get, the more you need it. I mean, how, how much how much actual education and learning do you think is happening to a third grader or a fourth grader over Zoom? The answer is about zero. 
And there are parents that are that are having to sit in these Zooms with their kids to make sure they pay attention. The taxpayers, the American people are paying for these public schools. Get your butt in the school, open it up, um, or here's a good idea, give everybody a refund. You're not going to have to keep, keep the heat on in that joint. You're not going to have to feed them anymore. Give the parents a refund so they can send their schools and get their kids educated somewhere else. Uh, like a, these learning pods are popping up everywhere. That'd be a good thing to put that refund money into. Do that. But it's, it, yeah. it, I don't even have kids. And I and we have, a, you know, obviously a public school district in there. And I pay taxes to it. I want a refund, too. Just because you guys aren't using it, you don't need it, especially if you're not going to go to school. This would be a perfect time to start a national uh, education savings account program. Yes, it would. Absolutely. And, and that was Isaac's point. And I think that Isaac and I think Isaac is right that you know schools are terrible. <laughs> the public school system's awful anyway. So you know why are we clamoring to get kids back into school? I understand Jim's point, but they don't doesn't have to go to public schools with the teachers' unions and go right. and go to go some they, other school. They can go to private schools right now. Right. So let's just give the parents the money and let them make the decision. That's what that's what we want anyway, and that's how it should. That's how the system should be. We have a system that holds people hostage now because it forces you, unless you have enough money to send your kid to a private school, it forces you to put your kid in whatever school that happens to be in your zip code, right, or your school district or whatever. So they're already holding kids hostage in that sense because you know there's no options for you unless you move. You know, so why not just give parents the ability to make the decision for themselves? You can homeschool them. You can put them in a private school. You could do whatever the heck you want with them. Just it doesn't. But you control the money that would I guarantee if that became the standard talking point yes. uh, on the other end of this, yes. that these teachers unions would tomorrow. Care. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, the money yeah. can always be following the child. That's the way it goes. But come on, let's be a little bit more realistic here. There is not the private school infrastructure to what in uh, five weeks, put all these kids in private schools and most micro schools, schools Jim. Jim uh, come on, man. We we uh, overhauled the entire economy in like a matter of like a month uh, because of I'm not, coronavirus. I'm not, I'm not worried about people that. People will at find all. a way. If there's money, people will find a way. Yeah, I mean, if people they, love their children, they'll find a way. Yeah, I mean, there's these learning pods and all of that. And then, and then I guess yeah, all these exactly. public school teachers so, are out of work, at least the ones that um, we stick with. No, the they'll, they'll, they'll quit and they'll go work for the private schools. That's, true. That's what they'll do. I mean, it, it, th this system that we have right now is a joke anyway. Yeah. And this is a perfect excuse to blow it up and start something new, which is what the left is doing on almost every single issue right now. So why don't we do it on the issue, one of the issues we care about the most, and you've got the right, instead of doing this, saying we got to open up the public schools <laughs> yes, again right. and send the yes. kids back to the socialist exactly. indoctrination it factories. It's like, screw that. No, man. Don't don't send them back there. That those places are trash. So, you know, buy, let's That's give right. parents the money and send them someplace else, and the teachers' unions can go take a walk. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Let's, and let's, and the let's... fact that if we don't do that, it is the biggest missed opportunity ever, and we deserve to lose forever. <laughs> That's why. Good luck. We. Yeah, they've well, gotten really? to a point like, where you're listening to conservative. You're right conservative talk radio and they're talking about how we got to get these kids back into public schools it's like no let's totally pivot the other direction and, and you know whose fault this is whose fault is this donald jim's no nope, it's not jim's fault <laughs> oh, jim, okay. jim is to blame for a lot of things but he's not to blame for this do you know whose fault it is uh who's it's donald trump yep oh it's one thousand percent donald trump because yep. donald trump made this his big thing Send the kids back to school. That became his thing. And and all of these other conservative people took that lead yeah. and said, yep, yep, send them back. And be and, and I understand why. It's for a lot of the reasons that Jim said before. It's the, the, you got to reopen the economy and all this stuff. And I get that. Uh, that's all true. But that's You're the reason why it makes no sense to send them back. And, yeah. and, and the reason that people take that position is because of Donald Trump. Yeah, you know what? Like, obviously, a lot of people kind of align. They they figure out they use him as a north star uh, for like their policy positions. If he says something, I got to go in the opposite direction, right? So it's I, I've always said that if he were to come out and say like, oh no, we got to keep these schools closed, the teachers union and everyone opposed to Donald Trump be like, no, 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 we need to get kids in schools today. Like, you know, fall is coming. We need them in schools today. But yeah, this is a this is perfect. Like, if he were to come out and say, you know what? 
public school systems failing. We need to do an ESA so that people don't have to send their kids to these, uh, you know, COVID factories. <laughs> you know, if they're worried about them getting sick, they can use this ESA money to, you know, explore all these other educational opportunities. The teachers unions would say, we got to get these public schools open today. Like that is, that is definitely the case. You're right. That should be the national conversation a, a blow up this system and do an ESA nationwide ESA program. Yep. Well, they should definitely do that after if they the longer the teachers unions do this and hold hold the schools and, and parents hostage, the, the, the stronger the position obviously is for ESAs. Um, you know, and now. this can't happen on a national level. You can't you can't uh, General Trump can't force my local, uh, you know, taxing district for the public schools to give me a refund so that I could give that money, uh, use that money to get uh, to, to set up a learning pod for me and some neighbors. Um, to teach my kid. And then they eventually, and I don't know, whatever, take the standard test you need to do to graduate. But there are a lot of parents out there where their kid was like a senior in high school and they were going to graduate from, from you know, it, it's not so cut and dry. This is an opportunity and it should be exploited by, by, by the forces for school choice for sure. But there is something quite disgusting about the idea that teachers will, they, they insist on continuing to get paid while not doing their jobs for like two straight years. Um, you know, they, they have to at least earn their keep and they're just, frankly, just at that, you know, right now there isn't quite the, the private school infrastructure. If everybody was just freelancing right now, I mean, in five weeks, it's a little tough. If Go ahead, you ask all these teachers, like they're going to say, we wish we were in the classroom too, but we're not able to. And there is a lot of extra work that goes into doing online learning that we don't think about. Like my sister is a teacher down in Florida. So like when, if you asked her, she'd be like, yeah, I'd rather be in the classroom, but that's probably, well, it might be in the cards for them. I'm not sure. So um, I get that argument, but you know, I, I don't, I don't know if you could say, well, they're not doing their job. Like they're trying to do their job. They're just not being able to do their job in the best way possible. So Isaac, uh, are you wearing a Brett Favre shirt? What else would I be wearing? Donald? <laughs> he wears that shirt every day. <laughs> he wears it like underneath everything. Like even when he's wearing suits and stuff, he's got that Brett Favre shirt underneath. I can't even bring myself to wash it. Yeah, be yeah, away but, from him for that much time. Yeah. But that, but this should be this should be the the thing though. Like the the takeaway from this segment is definitely you know forget about trying to argue to get kids back in these schools. No, let's disrupt the system. The system is disrupted. Let's kind of take that as the opportunity to push it in the direction that we want when it comes to school choice, education savings account. And all of that good stuff that we or talked about right schools. here. You don't even need the Heartland that. Institute. That's right. Yeah. Isaac's setting up a micro school in his basement. So if you want to sign up for that, go to IsaacOr.com <laughs> and roll your kid today. <laughs> Great idea. I should do uh, that. Justin, uh, you brought this topic up or you brought it to my attention. Any last words you want to say before we move on to another topic? No. Cool. All right. So this other topic. I, I got a thing to say. Hey, Is it people? about your curriculum? <laughs> Dinosaurs invented the Earth over 6,000 years ago. <laughs> the great T-Rex god <laughs> ate a giant Brachiosaurus, <laughs> and out of its skull came humanity. Yeah, yeah. Isaac's, Isaac's teaching his history lessons with, like, uh, <laughs> Jurassic Park, the movie. It's like, and then Newman gets eaten. <laughs> I think the I think the free market might uh, might deselect Isaac's learning pod. <laughs> no, but I, I think that we should say, look, just find a learning pod, and like it won't be. Here's the yeah. thing: like, what if they just scrap this entire year? Because there's no way. Yeah. Okay. So like, you can't actually test kids and have that be binding because not all the kids have access to the technology. So this is basically like the lost world. A lost <laughs> another um, Jurassic Park reference. Great. Yeah, I wanted to do that because I thought it would be clever. Um, but you might as well find them like either a private school that's accredited and they're open, right? Yeah. Or you need to find like a group of like basically six parents and they're all like being like on the same risk level for COVID, right? And they find a teacher who's willing to teach their kid right it's basically like reverting back to my grandma stedman's like yeah. experience as a one-room school teacher in rural wisconsin which is crazy to think that we might go back to something like that it would be but great if well here's the thing like if you actually want your kid to learn something this year that might be the best avenue yeah, stop, forward 
stop relying on the government to to solve this problem and, and placate all of these teachers unions across all these states. It's not going to happen. You I, gotta I have, figure out your own solution here. I agree with all that. I have one more point to make that I forgot to mention bef before, and I did want to bring this up. What, the, the, there is a, a couple of demands in that the teachers unions made that I think are really important. One is they, we talked about this. They want to end charter schools, right? So yeah, let's yeah. get rid of charter schools. We'll defund charter schools, but they also want extra social distancing within the classrooms so that, you know, there's social distancing. We're not spreading COVID. Okay. So we're ending the charter schools. Where are all those kids going? Where are they're they gonna going? Set, they're going to set up shop in the where, in the football stadiums. Where, that are yeah, like where where are they going? I thought that like I, if the goal is that we don't want to have too many people crammed into one room, why would you get rid of all these public schools and now you're sending them to your existing public schools? How are they supposed to take on all of these extra kids? In some places, charter schools have there's thousands of kids in charter schools in some in some states, like thousands. So what are you going to do with these kids? What are you going to do with all of them? It doesn't even make sense. It's so obvious that this is just a totally ridiculous political stunt. That's well, it's why it's, it's why it's an immoral use of leverage by the unions. I mean, you know, my, my main points, I mean, I, I'm with you guys, obviously, that, you know, the socialist indoctrination of an entire generation through our public school system. You're the person that complains awful. about that the most, Jim. Huh? You are the person that complains about that you're, the most. You're, you're right. My, my, my main point is like, you know, uh, I want my money back. And, you know, you're not going to I'm not paying public school teachers for not doing anything anymore. Um, that's that's like not a good the, trade -off. That's like the old they, white man anthem. Yeah, right. I want my money back. I want my money back. get off my lawn. But I think what we are, what we may see in this, these learning pods things are actually really interesting is that we are seeing the, the, um, the devolution of the system when it comes to education in America. I mean, I think the idea, we're, we're not going to go back to one room schoolhouses, although we might. Through these learning pods where, where, where parents really have no other choice. They have to, so your average parent has two things he needs to do. One, he needs to get his kid out of the house during the day so he can go to work. Uh, and two, they need to get their kid educated. Now, if you can set up a learning pod somewhere in a one room schoolhouse or in, or, in, or somewhere else, somebody else's home, you're basically, it's basically just kind of like group homeschooling. Um, and this is great. And I think eventually, maybe who knows how long the COVID crisis lasts and that public schools will not be able to open as normal. But we could be seeing, which would be great, the beginning of a of a much larger and broader devolution of uh, of the public school system, where 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 um, where parents, if they don't homeschool, they will do this other option that isn't quite private schools. It's not charter schools. It's certainly not public school. But it's more of a of a close community um, of, of 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 homeschooling through through the learning pods. And then just one last thing, I think it was in that piece I sent with you or sent to you, uh, uh, Donnie, on this on this subject. Um, as you would expect, a lot of parents that have been with their kids and had to quasi homeschool over the last uh, the end of the last term and now perhaps the beginning of this term, a very strong, a very good percentage, I think 40 percent said they would now strongly consider homeschooling full time moving forward. That is going to have an extremely disruptive effect on uh, on the public school system as we know it. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, Illinois actually has like a pretty lax uh, maybe this has changed, but uh, I was aware that like Illinois has a pretty lax like regulations when it comes to homeschooling. That's like one of the one of the few things that Illinois does well is like allow for homeschooling. And there's like tons of resources out there. There's like uh like what you were saying, group homeschooling. There's resources for that. You could like arrange it. You just gotta like look it up. Uh, Lenny Jarrett, when he was here, he would talk about this type of stuff all of the time. So these resources do exist out there. If this is, if you're kind of disillusioned with the idea that these public schools are going to come to their senses and reopen, start looking into this stuff, people. But I do want to move on. I want to talk about this briefly. We only got uh, about 10 minutes here. This, uh, this comes out of, uh, it's kind of related to Isaac's state there. Ilhan Omar, his favorite Senate representative, and Representative Bonnie Watson announced the introduction of uh, House Resolution 7477, the Workforce Promotion and Access Act, legislation aimed at getting more Americans back to work in living wage jobs created directly by the federal government. The bill authorizes the U.S. Department of Labor to create jobs guarantee programs through grants to states, localities, and tribal entities where employment is greater than 10% or double the national employment rate. 
So uh, jobs guarantee, jobs guarantee. So this got my attention because recently I've been reading a book by modern monetary theorist Stephanie Kelton, whose last chapter is dedicated to this idea of like it's super important to have a jobs guarantee program uh, where, you know, if you want a job, go to the federal government and they give you a job. So I was reading it and I was starting to think like, you know what, like I could see a lot of conservatives kind of falling for this. It's just like, oh, we're going to be paying people welfare anyways. They might as well pick up a shovel type of thing. Uh, so I, you know, I looked this up and, you know, found that there was this bill that was being proposed. So I wanted to kind of talk about this idea of a jobs guarantee. Justin, I think that I would hope that a lot of people listening to this are kind of skeptical of something like that. I think it's our job to make them more skeptical. So <laughs> what do you think? Federal jobs guarantee. I think that there's so many there there are so many problems with a federal jobs guarantee or any kind of jobs guarantee. The 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 most I, I think one of the most striking issues beyond just the cost of it, which obviously we can't afford to do, is that really what it does is it gives the government power over the entire labor market not mm. just the part of the labor market where they're employing people and people don't necessarily think it all the way through they just think oh well you know they're going to give these people jobs it, it, yeah but they decide what the living wage is whatever that means which just a definition that changes constantly they right. decide what the benefits are going to be right and so all of that now becomes because they're going to guarantee you a job anyone who wants this can get this job then what that means is that everybody else has to pay at least that has to provide at least those benefits, because why would I work for some private businesses that paying me less money or giving me worse benefits than what the government's giving me? So if they set the living wage at $25 an hour, then that's the, that's the minimum wage. You don't ever have to change the minimum wage law ever yep. again. They just say, Oh, $25 an hour. That's what we're paying people. That becomes the minimum wage. So it, it's total control over the labor market. It's complete control over the labor market. And it's not just wages and benefits. It's also just work hours, conditions, all sorts of other things. Like what if they said, we're going to pay everybody a salary. You know, what if they stop doing it? They, they, they have a certain job. They give you a, it's a salaried position. And then they say, you only have to work 25 hours a week for whatever this job is, X, Y, Z job. Who's going to work for 40 hours a week in the private sector for that same job? They're not. They're going to go work for the government for 25 hours a week, right? So it's total control over the labor market in, in throughout the entire country, wherever these programs exist, that's exactly how it would work. So it really is giving the federal government a massive amount of control or state and local governments, depending on how you build the program, massive control over the labor market. And then the other thing is, what do these people do? You know, yeah. what, what, what are they doing in the, in the press release that they issued? They, they talked about how there's been 45 million people have lost their jobs during this pandemic. Okay. So, so we have this program and 45 million people show up the next day to <laughs> go get jobs with the government. Like, what do you, what are you going to do with 45 million people? What are you going to do with those people? Right. There's not enough. There's not enough things that you could even imagine that's worth these people doing. So all they can do in effect is get into all these different businesses that they're not in now take over all sorts of industries because you got to find something for these people to do. So now all of a sudden the federal government has this big incentive to start, you know, hamburger joints because what else are we going to do with these? No, they'll all be like people? paper pushers and political activists, even like paper community pushers. organizers, even, like right. even, even community organizers. The, the federal government has about 10 million employees. Now that includes military. All right. 10 million people, 45 million people would be four times that like they can't even imagine jobs for 45 million people without cool over other industries that are already run by the private sector. Well, that's what the other part of the Green New Deal is for. People who are unable or unwilling to work, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. So they, they wouldn't have to actually come up with that many jobs because they just pay people to not work. You well, mean, yeah, that's true too. Right, which, but, is, which is the same thing as unemployment insurance. Why don't we just stick with what we got? <laughs> I mean, you, you ask what, the, what, what, the, what these people are going to do in these government jobs. It, it reminded me of that uh, of that quote that goes, you know, from Milton Friedman, who's by the way, Milton Friedman's birthday is uh, is Friday, July thirty uh, first. So that's uh, I think yeah. Who else's birthday is on that 13? day? Thirteen. Anyway, uh, the story where he was, he was 
He was yeah, visiting well, an Asian country. Who else's his birthday? Was that? This guy right here. Don, oh, I birthday. share the birthday of Milton Friedman. But yes, go that? ahead. Milton Friedman quote. Go ahead. Jim, Jim why were you going to skip that part? That's the, the most important part. Trouble. You buried the lead. <laughs> so Milton Shame Friedman. on you. Oh, my gosh. You're going to keep talking over me. That's great. <laughs> So yes, he, Milton Friedman was an Asian country, and they're building a canal. And they're using shovels, and he asked, "Why weren't they using, um, you know, earth movers and you know, ditch diggers and and bulldozers and all of that kind of stuff?" And the uh, the government guy from the Asian country said, well, "Because this is a jobs program." And he said, "Well, if it's a jobs program, why don't you have them digging out with spoons?" And so, you know, that that's what makes me think about these government, uh, you know, make work projects from the from the from the Depression era to to now is that. You know they're not efficient. This is not the way to find the best people working for the best jobs. Um, you know the minimum wage already distorts the labor market in in many ways. In that um, employers can't pay what they believe uh, a worker is worth, and then compete with other uh, businesses to to make sure that they get the workers the best workers that they can get and the workers that they need. Instead, the government is just going to be basically taking people who do not have the skills, frankly, to work in the private sector, but they'll also be taking away some other people that should be working in the private sector. This entire thing is a complete economic disaster because we don't have the money to pay for it. And it actually uh, you know, doesn't do anything productive and, and useful overall for society. So it says that um, it, it, it lists off a couple of things that these people's jobs could theoretically be. It says like child and elder care, infrastructure, clean energy and community revitalization. But yeah, it kind of leaves it open to the whims of like the localities or whoever's getting these grants uh, to determine what these people are going to be doing with these guaranteed jobs. So 45 million people times by 40 hours a week. That's weekly 1.8 billion uh, hours of labor that's going to be at the whims of like the governments. It's like they got like an army now. Like they could just bring people door to door with like census questions. How many guns you got? Are you green energy compliant? You know, like there's just like an unlimited amount of stuff that they can do. It's an incredible amount of power. There's all there's also that's that's true. And that's terrifying. But there's also um, that this particular version of it says that they only want to do it in places where the unemployment rate is like 10 percent. Right. Where it yeah. reaches 10 percent. Well, that's really that, that that that's a horrible provision, because now what you've done is given an incentive to that local government. <laughs> to yeah. have unemployment at at least 10% right. because now you get this big gigantic government money flooding in that allows you to create this shiny new jobs program that gives everybody a job. So why would, why wouldn't you want it? If you're some local government, why wouldn't you want unemployment to be 10% or higher? Of course you would want that. So you would do everything in your power, everything in your power to make sure that you get 10% unemployment. That's a That's great what point. You would do. Yeah. And, and, it like it would be so easy for them to do it, right? All you have to do is just say, you know what, uh, healthcare is too expensive in this county, so we're just gonna jack up taxes on on you know hospitals, these private hospitals, and we're gonna take that money and we're gonna put it into public hospitals, right? So now you've jacked up all the taxes. They have to lay off healthcare workers or whatever, and now you get it over ten percent. Now you get this huge chunk of money from the federal government. Brand new jobs program. Everybody goes and works for this public hospital. Boom. Like you just run that whole thing yeah. out of business. Or, and you have every reason to do it. You know, raise, it's ra raise taxes, raise minimum wage uh, until, yeah, the uh, unemployment hits above 10 percent. And then you theoretically get unlimited money to just provide jobs for everybody else so that you can make your parks look nicer. Yeah, there's like it's crazy perverse incentives that would be go along with all of this but uh well you're so you're telling me you're telling me socialist economic theory doesn't really work and uh has the wrong no, and no, it's no, no. the opposite of what they claim no no, no. i'm wow. saying it works exactly the way they want it to work that's right yeah it, that, works. it works exactly the way they want it to yeah work. it, it, it works this exactly isn't a mistake right. this isn't a mistake they know what they're doing yep uh, gentlemen, we are out of time. Let's wrap this thing up. Anyone got any jokes, anecdote, anecdotes? Uh, I can't even say that word today. Uh, last things to get off their chest before we sign off for the week. I saw the movie Mr. Jones uh, this week. Um, it's a movie about... Uh, it start well. It stars one of the characters is Walter Durante, and it and uh, Mr. Jones is a Gareth Jones, a British journalist, 
who went to uh, Stalin's Soviet Union and exposed the truth about the Ukrainian famine while mm. uh, Walter Duranty was covering it up. Uh, it, I saw it recommended by several conservative uh, sites. The Wall Street Journal did a, did a little piece on it and also National Review. I highly recommend you go see um, you see Mr. Jones. It's on, streaming on Amazon right now. You can get it for five bucks. It's uh, one of the best movies I've seen in, in at least two years. Nice. All right. Yeah. I, uh, I just watched Mighty Ducks 2 for like the third time. <laughs> So, <laughs> all right, everyone. Thanks Mighty for tuning, Ducks in, too. <laughs> tuning into this episode of the In the Tank podcast. Join us every Friday for a new episode of In the Tank. If you like our show, please subscribe. Write a review for us on iTunes. We greatly appreciate it. You can find us on pretty much everything nowadays. Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, obviously. If you'd like, you can follow us on Socialist Twitter at In the Tank Pod. If you'd like, you can send us questions, jokes, uh, suggestions for stories by emailing us at in the tank podcast at gmail.com. Justin, where can the fine people find you? At Justin T. Askins on Facebook and socialist Twitter. And Jim Lakely, same question. At Jay Lakely at Heartland Inst on Twitter and always go to heartland.org. Isaac Orr, where can the fine people find you? At American Experiment.org. And on socialist Twitter at the fracking guy. All right. Thank you all for tuning in. We will talk to you next week.